Well, when you look online and you see information coming out with, from various entities or hunting groups, uh, it can be very conflicting on how to actually age a buck. And I think you need to take a step back. And we need to look at what is the best way for researchers and scientists to age a buck and what is the best way for you to age a buck unless you're a researcher or scientist and very few are. There's a big difference between actual hunters in the field, hunting all the time, watching bucks all the time, watching deer and deer researchers. Big difference. Because we don't have the luxury, for example, even some of the ways that, are, that hunting is done so, down south more where you're sitting in a box blind looking at a green field, waiting for deer coming out of the thick brush. You might watch that buck for 15, 20 minutes before you actually shoot him. I wrote uh, our, an article a long time ago. Um, it's called the 10 second rule for bow hunting. I'm sure you could find it if you look up on Google and I've, and I've created videos for that, but it's a 10 second bow hunting rule. Meaning when I look at my top 20 bucks, 80, 90% gave me 10 seconds or less to look at them, identify them, grab my bow, know they're a shooter, put the release on the string, pull back and shoot them before they walk by. 10 seconds or less. That's why you always see me, if, if you see me online, either my bow between my legs, standing up upright in, in the videos, or it's hanging right in front of my face where I can simply put the release on the string and pull back and shoot. Because historically, going back decades, you don't get a lot of time when you're actually hunting in the woods, hunting funnels, hunting the rut, Bucks are cruising through. You're not just sitting in like they are on the outdoor channel watching them for 15, 20 minutes come in to give you a shot. That's not realistic, folks. It's not realistic for hunters. It's more realistic for researchers, biologists, people that are hunting in fenced-in operations that they can look all the time. So when it comes down to it, these top three right here, great for researchers, bad for hunters. We'll talk about why. Body. Body is awesome. This is definitely a great way. When you have that neckline, and I'm not talking during the rut, I'm talking before the rut, like right now it's early October, mid-October, and you look in September, August, but when you see that neckline getting down to that brisket, more mid-season like this, it can be very deceiving during the summer because those skinny necks, small framed, it looks like they don't have a lot of meat on, they don't. You can even see the ribs a lot of times in midsummer of a big mature buck. It can, it can be deceiving. You almost like you'd look at the body and add a year compared to what you do in the fall. It's a lot younger if you look at the body during the summer compared to the fall. But during the, during the fall, when you have that neckline going right down to the brisket, and then you have that sway in the back, looks from behind the shoulder, dips down a little bit, and goes back up. And then you have that big gut hanging down. You say, wow, that buck's at least five or older. When they're four, they're more like a stallion. They look sleek. They still have that solid body. The neck will still come down to the brisket, but you don't necessarily have that drop and sway in the back. It looks like a saddle. You don't have that. You don't have as big a belly sometimes. We have some of our older bucks right now that you can actually see wrinkles in their neck. And you think, man, those things are getting flabby. It's starting to look like an old man. You know, you can really see as they age. And so there's ways you can say, well, that's six instead of five. That's seven instead of six. But for hunters, we're looking at, you know, is that a year and a half old or a yearling? Is that a year and a half old with its first set of antlers? Is that a two-year-old, three-year-old? And in your area, you might be shooting at every three-year-old that walks by. Maybe you're waiting for a five-year-old or a four-year-old. The four-year-old is when a buck finally reaches maturity, skeletal size and body size. So there's big changes body-wise up to a four. Doe reaches maturity at two and a half. So buck takes a little bit longer, therefore most of the time a lot bigger body. And uh, But body ultimately is a great way. But how many of us have time to look at? As bucks come in, we have 10 seconds. You look at the back, you look at the brisket, the neckline. But then he's by. You, you need a chance at him. And that's the problem with a lot of these scientific research ways to judge a buck. Judging a buck on paper. I'll tell you what, I've had a lot of times where I'm watching certain bucks all the time on trail cam photos, even in the field, I can see them over and over. But when the moment of truth arrives and he's coming through and you have 10 seconds to shoot him, there's been multiple times I've shot a mature buck knowing he was a mature buck. I get down and it's a different buck than I thought it was. But I was just shooting because he was a mature buck. And I'll talk about how I think is most hunter friendly and how to, how to, way to actually age a buck when you're in the field and you're actual hunting. Let's look at jawbone and teeth. These are ways that, you know, a jawbone in a given area and the, and the tooth wear analysis, that'll be somewhat consistent, but it's not uh, foolproof. Sending the teeth into the lab, I used to think was a 95, 98% thing. It's not. In fact, Deer Research QDMA put out this. This is a, um, it was 262 known age bucks. They were up to eight and a half years old. So it's interesting in this chart, you can see the guesstimates of their five research biologists, I believe this is Texas A&M, 
conducted under Dr. Mickey Hellickson. But this is a chart we have right here, and, and Dylan will show that to you. But you can see that four and a half year old buck, when they send the tooth in, when they sent the teeth in, to the owner of the lab is actually the one that did this. They were right approximately 55% of the time on a four and a half year old buck. These are deer research biologists who do this for a living. Not necessarily the DNR officer that's checking in your deer at a check station. They might look at bucks, age them, but these are guys that study deer full time. A deer research biologist is different than a wildlife biologist. Uh, Dylan, um, you're a wildlife, um, what's your, you have a wildlife degree. Wildlife ecology, yep. So in order to be a whitetail, I'm putting you on the spot. I yeah, didn't yeah. talk to Dylan ahead of time, but I know he would know this a lot more than me. Um, but to be an actual deer research biologist and have that and even work towards a PhD, what would you have to do? I, I don't even know. I didn't even really look into becoming that level of, you know, deer fanatic, but I know you would have to go to grad school and work on research papers. Yeah, like and put Texas together. A&M is a yeah. grad school. Yeah. Uh, University of Georgia, I think, is another grad school for deer research biologists. Yep, yep. So I'm not really sure exactly, you know, what qualifications you have to get along the way, but it's a lot more involved and in-depth than what I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yours is more general. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the average uh, wildlife biologist is more general. They're not going towards a specific. Um, yeah, I think towards once, uh, they, once they go in through grad school and you know get their masters, et cetera, become a doctor. Um, at that point, they've probably become more specific. Right, and, and so these these people that are judging this, um, they're they're research biologists. These are deer research biologists, and um jawbone they were right about 44 percent of the time 43 on a four and a half year old buck sending the teeth in it was uh they're right about 55. even at a two-year-old which you can look at most two-year-olds and say yeah it's a two-year-old but they were right 78 percent of the time guessing jawbone and sending the teeth in they were right 70 percent of the time so we're not even getting close to that 95 98 percent i thought in the past six and a half year old this is where it really bottomed out on this chart because again, I think they had a final age of eight and a half. They knew the box that out of those 262 went up to eight and a half years older. They began to figure it out. But anyways, uh, jawbone aging, they're right 18% of the time. Sending the tooth in, they're right 46% of the time. Think about that. You have a big buck you bring in. It's five and a half years old actually. Well, if they're guessing the jawbone, and these are research biologists, they're 26% of the time they were correct when you shot a five and a half year old buck. Sending the teeth in, they were right 48% of the time. These are their numbers, not mine. This is their chart, not mine. I think it's a cool illustration. But the point is, when you're looking at teeth or jawbone, it's a great way for research biologists to compare one buck to the next, or one doe to the next, or one doe compared to a buck not certainly a way that you're going to use in the field like you could a body but not a very good way overall as hunters to look at it even after the kill i don't want to know within 40 percent or 35 percent if that four-year-old or five-year-old is actually that age antlers now the research community would look at the scientific community and say oh you can't go by antlers and rightfully so you know the antlers from texas compared to the UP and Michigan might be the same. But what about Texas to Oklahoma, Oklahoma to Tennessee, Arkansas? We'll give a shout out to Arkansas. Dylan, I never mentioned Arkansas and someone made that comment about that. How about a little love for Arkansas? So Arkansas, a little story, I've had clients in a lot of states um, and Arkansas is one of them. Uh, the public land bucks down there, and I'm sure we won't have a flood of people running down to Arkansas because not many people watch the channel, so it's no big deal, but Public land, Arkansas. The guy that I went down there, the client, some monsters on public land you showing me pictures of. Okay. And uh, it was not what I ex expected, but he said not a lot of hunters. They get to a really cool age, and when they get good age, and they're in an area like that, that they don't have winter kill, don't have stress, uh, not too hot, not too cold, um, they can get giant. And uh, so it's you know, kind of a sleeper area uh, about Arkansas. But bottom line is, it's interesting how you go from area to area, like a Southern Michigan buck might be similar to a Eastern Ohio buck as far as giant potential, as far as genetics. And so antlers, similar, you can almost categorize from Northern uh, Michigan, uh, Alpena area is gonna be different than Traverse City. Traverse City has more farmland, Alpena. So the antlers are gonna be a little bit smaller out over Alpena way. It's gonna be that dark chocolate, Northern deer, you know, if you shoot 140 inch there, you're shooting one of the king of the woods in that area where that might be 175 over in the Traverse City area, just because of ag land, even similar snowfall region and temperature. Different habitat types, obviously, with more ag land versus more uh, conifer and sand. 
uh, sandy soil. So once you figure that out, and obviously, so if you're looking at antlers, you can't say overall, well, that, those antlers, you can't compare. You can compare teeth to teeth, even though it's not very accurate. But it's a way of researchers to, to age deer. Antlers, they're not consistent from one area, but they're pretty consistent within an area. And what I mean by that is in an area, a lot of times you're looking at four-year-olds in our area, they're going to be around 150 inches. Not all, but it's going to fall into a category of 145 to 155, and you can put 80% of the four-year-olds in that category. And it doesn't mean there's not some that are greater or some that are smaller. It means there's a good average. And what does that mean for a good average? Whether it's 70%, 80%, that means if you know the box in your area, completely, I mean, you you look at that yearling buck, they're rarely outside of 10, 12 inches wide. You look at those two-year-olds, they're almost always 14, 15 inches wide, even in bad areas, which is the tip of the ears. Dylan made a mistake a few years ago, a couple years, not made a mistake, but he had a nice buck come in, the antlers are sticking out past the ears. You walk up to him and there's some ground shrinkage because it was in North Dakota or Nebraska. North Dakota. Yeah, there's fro deer get frostbite when they're bite when they're out in the open and literally their ears, tips of the ears can freeze off. So you say half the ears were gone? Yeah. So when you're looking at this buck that's like this and the antlers are out past that, you think, well, that's 20 inches wide, but not if half the ear's gone on each side. And so that's it. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even imagine. <laughs> there are that some shrinkage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw the pictures. It was pretty cool. I mean, it's that's because I've seen that in the UP of Michigan. And uh, I showed that picture of a fawn one time in John Azoga. It was about a two and a half year old, or year and a half old. So it would have been fawn the year before. And why are these tips of the ears gone? What happened? They something bite off each tip. It doesn't make sense. And he said, that's frostbite. You know, they, they were bedded in an exposed area, probably with not a lot of snowfall, not a lot of insulation or thermal protection, a lot of wind. And that's why deer move out of the wind to bed, even if it's on the north facing slope, because if you have cold south winds, it'll freeze those tips of the ears off. So they need to get on the north side. It doesn't matter if it's shady or not. That doesn't matter much at all. They need to get out of the wind. And uh, so two-year-olds, a lot of times they're right about the tips of the ears if they're not frostbit off, but that's extreme. Uh, Three-year-olds are outside the tips of the ears, typically. But still, if you look at that deer from the side, a lot of times the antlers come around and it's between more of the eye and the tip of the nose. When we start to get to four, four years old, and that buck gets that mature frame, then when you reach around, and this was four or five-year-old buck, who knows? Wasn't three, probably. When you look at that, if you imagine the tip of the nose down here, then the tip of the antlers, even with the tip of the nose somewhere around here, that's a somewhat good way to tell. You can't really tell that overall, but a lot of times if, if this buck isn't this wide in an area like this, and maybe the beams sweep around a little bit more, he might be taller. There's something, or he might have more mass. You start to look at, yeah, I can fit that buck because of mass, because of how long the beams are sweeping around, because of that overall width. Any one of those combinations, you can start to say, man, the tips, or even with his nose, you can start to say, man, that's four-year-old plus. Now, I add another thing. If you look at those antlers, and then you start looking at body, color, and attitude. Attitude, I mean by, I watched a five-year-old the other night for about an hour. And it was cool because when Jen came down the driveway, a uh, quarter mile away, 300 yards away, across the hollow, so it's like straight line, that buck in the dark stood back there, and I could watch him with the binoculars, 25 yards away, and he stood and just watched her, watched not actual sight of the vehicle going down the driveway, going up to the road and around, but actually watch the sound. And he just stood there and he followed that noise with his eyes, looking in that direction all the way till she stopped. And then 20 seconds later, he just went on his way. Went on his way, meaning he started focusing on getting a drink, which took another 10 minutes for him to move towards that water hole, only a matter of five yards. They are in no hurry year and a half olds two and a half does fawns they always got a place to go and they're they're moving they're playing around you see fawns dance play that's the opposite you see fawns chasing each other having a good time we've seen them run through our water hole they they like to have fun it seems like they're having fun they're chasing each other they dodge they weave you don't see mature bucks doing that they move slowly they have an attitude they step with a purpose they move with a purpose and then you add color coloration. John Zolka, a deer research bi biologist up in UP in Michigan that watched a lot of deer. One thing I was really interested in so many things that he told me. The one thing is he said that deer tend to blend in with their environment, uh, mature buck. If they're out in the marshes and out in open sunlight, why do you think you find a shed antler and it's white? Because the sun bleaches it. It's just sitting there. There's no leaves on the trees. It sits there and it's bleached. It turns white. Um, I had a friend show me a picture of a mule deer uh, shed he found just out elk hunting in New Mexico. It was back in some conifers. It was a really dark antler really dark, but it doesn't hit the sun. 
so it just stays dark. So think about that mature buck. Those year and a half olds, two and a half year olds, they're out in the sun all the time because they're out in the open. They don't really care. They're going to out feed an hour before. They're out there with does and fawns or playing around, but those mature bucks step out of last light. If they're stepping out of last light in September and October with foliage on the leaves, they're not exposed to the sun much at all. In fact, I've even seen four and a half year old plus bucks step out into a field and the does get nervous. Why they get nervous? Just a deer? Because rarely have they seen that four year old, five year old, six year old buck out there during the daylight near them at daylight hours. At some point he is, at some point during the summer they are. But it's not a common occurrence because they're older, wiser, they have attitude. But you can even look at coloration. So what does that mean? Even their hides, their antlers, they're darker if they're back in the shadows much. Now there are those big bucks out west Marshland bucks that get hit with the sun all, all day, but then they blend in with the grasses around them and weeds. It's pretty cool how that works. The sun kind of bleaches them to their surrounding area. So when you see that big buck walking that's slow with a purpose, not in a hurry, still only have 10 seconds to shoot him though, but he's coming toward you. He's got antlers that are wide, high, heavy. They go out to the tips of his ears, tips of his uh, nose, come around that far. He's got an attitude with that walk. He's, like I said, not in a hurry. They're dark, dark body. You can just say, man, that's a mature buck. And you know what? Even then, you're still wrong 20% of the time, 10% of the time, because you can't ever be 100% sure. Look at the teeth. Look at how research biologists, they accept those levels of inaccuracy. I don't. I think we can do a lot better by looking at antlers, looking at body, looking at attitude in a quick snap, 10, 10 seconds, make a judgment. Watch some of that. I used to do that with my kids, watch Outdoor Channel and and we'd see a buck coming in on uh, the Drury Brothers back in the day, just going back 20 years, you know, on the old DVD days, uh, it, VHS, I have VHS tapes of the Drury Brothers back in the day. They look at that buck when they first see it coming in and say, how old, is it mature? Look away, how old, you just snap, you need to do that in one or two seconds. That's realistic hunting expectation, which is a lot different than realistic deer research and scientific. Body's always the best. Combine a little, little bit of the body attributes and attitude with antlers, and you're gonna be very, very accurate. Way more accurate than jawbone, accepted research and scientific um, age analysis of uh, jawbone and teeth. Again, this is coming from a hunter for hunters, not for a textbook somewhere. That's how you age, age buck. Check out this something. We'll talk about this and more on the Jeff and Dylan Deer Talk podcast. We're shooting the first one here in, well, we got to get out hunting, but we still have, what, two hours before hunting? Yeah, we got time. Yeah, so we're going to we're gonna shoot the first one today. It'll be crude. It'll be with these mics right here, so you might not like the Bear sound. with us. We're just yeah. starting. This is ground zero, but yeah, we're we, better. We don't know what the heck we're doing. Yeah. So we can talk about this stuff. We meet about 50 times a year to film. So we figure we can throw a podcast in there and get that going. And it's another way we can bring information to you for free. Also allow you to get to know us a little bit better too, whether that's for good or bad. But uh, Dylan's the entertainer of the two. We'll probably bring Jen in there every once in a while. She's, she's very entertaining. Um, you have to check out my Instagram with some of the clips. But uh, make sure you, you look, up, look us up, both up on Instagram and um, and then also check out our podcast when that comes out. And I uh, really appreciate you guys watching. And there'll be a way in our podcast we can actually talk about some of uh, some of you guys that are, are really good uh, supporters that always comment and always like our stuff. And uh, we appreciate your comments. And I, I'm not even going to mention any because I, I'm going to miss some, but we'll try to mention some of those in some of the podcasts just so that we can give a shout out to you but at the same time uh, actually comment about some of your comments and bring you into the discussion with us on those podcasts so i hope this information helps thank you and have a great hunt this fall i urge everyone out there to really check out my web classes they've been wildly successful we have one that details how you should design your land another one that details how you should plant and maintain and manage a food plot program how can you make those decisions that fit your land specifically and not someone else's? Unfortunately, there's so much information in the hunting industry that says you should do this, but it doesn't apply to you. These web classes directly apply to you. And then we have our third web class that came out last year, rut web class, navigating the entire rut. And then we have our fourth one coming out, which is hunting hills and thermals. I urge you to check those out try the web classes and they're all about teaching helping you understand how you can navigate not only managing your property food plots in the rut but also hunting hunting strategically hills thermals and wherever you pursue whitetails for your dream and your passion